Well, <clears throat> as I've already told you, and I think you're already aware, the, um, Paul didn't deal with the first four commandments. Uh, he didn't deal with the greatest commandment, but rather the second greatest commandment. So what I'd like to do is deal with the greatest commandment from another passage of Scripture where our Lord Jesus tells us you know, what, what these commandments are, what the greatest commandments are, quoting Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, and then adding to it the, the second greatest commandment, which we've already looked at uh, this morning. So let me read for you Mark 12, um, verses 28 through 34. This, this will be our text for this evening, but again, we're going to focus mainly on um, the greatest commandment. Okay. So, beginning in verse 28, uh, Mark writes, One of the scribes came and, and heard them arguing, and we'll see who they were uh, in the sermon, and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, right teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and there is no one else beside him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength. And to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. Well, may the Lord um, bless his word again to our our understanding this evening. Now, remember, uh, this morning we saw after um, telling us of the debt that we are a government for doing their God-ordained work of protecting us, Paul went on to tell us about another debt that we owe, and that is loving our neighbor. Now, remember, this love is to take a, a certain shape, that which our Lord describes in, in the Ten Commandments that we are to honor the authority that God gives our neighbor, we are to protect their lives, protect their purity, their possessions, and their reputations. Uh, Paul said this is a love that we are to show everyone, not only because God commands it, and, and everything, of course, he commands is always right, always good, always best, but also because of, of what our neighbor is. Remember the image of God. We need to honor them because they are made in the image of God, and because of who they are. Remember, there are brothers, our sister, our, our cousins, you know, maybe a thousand times removed and who knows what, but we're all related, right? We're all related. We're one family. We didn't, you know, evolution, of course, would teach us that, you know, that uh, it took place, essentially life began not just in one place, but in many places in the world, and we all look different because we all evolved from different places. Okay, well, it's astronomically impossible that that could ever happen once. And it didn't happen. It, God created us, and we all come from one set of parents, which means we are all related, and because we are, we all have a responsibility to love each other. And of course, lastly, we saw we owe this debt because... We owe God for loving us, and this is what he calls us to do. Now, again, if we want to see what that looks like in action, we just simply need to look at Jesus' example and study it because he paid this debt by loving his neighbor perfectly. So he is always going to be the paradigm. He is going to be the example. Now, Paul only dealt with the commandments that have to do with our neighbor because they flowed from what he had said regarding our obligation towards the government, which is an application of the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother, so honor authority, and this is how we honor our government. He was reminding us this morning that we're not only obliged to honor them, but also others, okay? We're bound to love and respect everyone. Now, this evening, let's consider that we're also obligated to love God, as our Lord tells us in, in our passage. 
And what we want to see is, of course, how the, the other four commandments give shape to, to this love. Now, first of all, let's consider the context of the passage we're looking at. Okay, Jesus is now in Jerusalem for his last Passover feast on the last week of his earthly ministry before his crucifixion. As we know, he's been cornered by all these different religious leaders, and he's answering their questions. He's answering the questions of the Pharisees, you know, who were the religious leaders of, of Israel. He's answering the question of the Herodians, and those are the, the Jews that supported the Herods as kings, and they were the ones interested in the, que the question of, should we pay taxes to Caesar, you know? Um, the Sadducees, the theological liberals who denied life after death, who denied spirits, they were the ones asking the questions about, uh, suppose a man uh, had a wife and, and then that wife, the husband dies and she marries all these others, who's, you know, whose wife will she be of all, this, all these in the resurrection? So they're all asking questions to trip him up in areas that they were concerned and of course, the scribes and the lawyers who copied the scriptures were also there. Um, they were the experts in the law. That's why they were called the lawyers. Now, it's one of these who was listening to the ongoing debate and noticing that Jesus was giving good answers to their questions. And so he decided to ask one of his own, one that had to do with his particular study. And that is, what commandment is the foremost of all? By which he means, of course, which of the commandments in Scripture is the most important one. Well, Jesus answered this question. He says in verses 29 to 31, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And, of course, these are the greatest because they fulfill the Ten Commandments, the, the law of love. The greatest being that we love God, but the other flowing from it. Now, when the scribe heard him, he agreed with what Jesus said. When Jesus saw that the scribe actually understood what the Scriptures were saying, that, that was rare. And he didn't appear hostile like the others, trying to trip him up, but it was an honest question. He said to him in verse 34, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, he didn't mean that he was in the kingdom of heaven. He wasn't far from it, though. Perhaps because he was awakened, you know, the, uh, he was convicted by the Spirit. The Spirit was giving him this interest in the Word of God. He was devoting himself to, to himself to serious study. He really wanted to know the answer to this question. But he wasn't there yet because he hadn't come all the way. He hadn't yet believed on the Lord Jesus Christ because it's only by trusting in him that we can enter into God's kingdom. But again, the, you know, what is the greatest commandment? What is it that God wants us to do above everything else? Well, to love him first, to love him most of all, to put him at the very center of our lives, to live for his glory. This, the scribe believed, is more important. It's much more than all burnt offering and sacrifice. You can, you can offer burnt offerings and sacrifices all day, but if you don't do this, it'll mean nothing to God. Not to mention the fact that actually if we could do these things, if we could love God in this way and our neighbor, the burnt offerings and the sacrifices really wouldn't be required. But of course, we can't do that. And that's why we need Jesus. He could do these things. He did do these things. And we know he also died to pay for our failings. Now, let's consider this command, okay, the, the debt of love that we owe to the Lord and how we pay it. Now, we already know why we owe it, you know, because of all the love God has shown to us. His infinite love his infinite mercy, His infinite grace in giving us His Son. I mean, what more could the Lord do? But we also owe it to Him because of who He is, and we, we don't want to forget that. Remember, we, we want to love the giver and not just the gift that He gives. So who is God? Well, He is the one who is perfectly holy, and that means that He 
is perfectly loving, he is perfectly good, he is perfectly gracious, he is perfectly merciful, he is perfectly just. And saying that he is perfectly holy is to say that he is perfectly loving and lovely, and that means that he above everything and everyone else is to be loved. Okay, so the fact that he is holy means that he should be loved more than any other. So what he's done and who he is, that is what is our motivation, the why, the reason why we are to love him. Now, how much love do we owe him? Well, Jesus says all that we have to give, all the love with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, that is to be the level of intensity with which we love him. You know, Jonathan Edwards talks about the fact that there are differing degrees of love, you know, there, there's um, that affection that is perhaps so, so little that it moves you in just barely beyond indifference. And along that scale, you can move to the other end where, where that love is so intense that you would lay down your life for the Lord, you would live for His glory. Which do you think He desires of us? Well, remember the Lord tells us some pretty strong language in, in Revelation 3.15. He doesn't want us to be uh, lukewarm, which would be somewhere towards the indifferent side. He wants us to be hot or cold, either before Him or against Him, but don't be in the middle, okay? He wants us to be hot. And again, remember what happens to what He says will happen to those who are lukewarm, which obviously are those who don't have his spirit in them. They don't love him with the kind of zeal that he desires, and one day they will be judged severely. So we are to love him with all that we have, our whole heart and everything. But what about the shape, the form that this love is to take? You know, we talk about the strength of desire within us. Well, how should it be expressed? Well, as was the case with our neighbor, so it is here. God does not leave it up to us to figure it out. You know, what, what can I do to show my love to the Lord? Well, I'll build this temple. I'll make this sacrifice. I'll, I'll take this person and sacrifice them. You know, well, no. God doesn't leave it up to us to figure out how He wants us to love Him. He tells us exactly how He wants us to love Him in the first four commandments. So He says first... You shall have no other gods before me. And in a certain sense, this is a summary of, of everything that he desires of us. This is a summary of our whole duty. If, if we do this, if we have God as our God, then we will do these other things. You know, it may be the way of, another way of simply stating the greatest commandment. You know, to love him the most, that's what it means to have God as our God, and to have no other God or nothing that we love more than Him before Him. It means to put Him first in our hearts. It means to love Him the most. Now, if we love God the most, if He is our greatest love, then He will also be first in our minds. We'll always be thinking about Him and what He wants us to do and how we might please Him in every decision that we make, you know. What, what should I do? Remember how we always have those two choices we saw this morning? Either to yield to the Spirit who's saying, do what God tells you to do, or the flesh that says, do what feels good, you know, and um, what feels good for your flesh. So we always have these two choices. Well, if we have God first in our hearts and in our minds, then we are going to be making those choices that will please Him in, in everything that we have to do. We'll also dedicate all of our powers, all of our abilities that we have in our bodies, strength, and in our minds, intelligence. You know, everything we have, both those things as well as our natural and spiritual gifts, we will devote them and dedicate them to the worship and service of God, not only the Father, but also His Son. Remember, we are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus, you know, in Scripture compares our relationship to Him uh, to a marriage. You know, in a marriage, a husband and wife give themselves to each other. And if either of them gives themselves to another, they're committing adultery. 
Now, likewise, in our relationship with the Lord, if we give ourselves to another God, which doesn't mean, again, for us today, we set up an idol and begin to worship it, although that could be true. <laughs> but we have other kinds of idols that we worship. You know, we worship material things. We worship wealth. We worship fame. We, wor we worship power. Uh, these are the things that might easily supplant God and become greater loves in our heart than, than He is. If we love something, if we love someone, even, even our spouses, more than Him, that's spiritual adultery. Remember what, what the Lord said to the kings of, of Judah and Israel? Just think of it when they were combined, you know, and the monarchy was existed. <clears throat> he said to the kings, do not multiply wives for yourselves. Don't marry a foreign wife because she might try to draw your heart away to foreign gods, okay? Well, the Lord knew of, of the man's vulnerability to, to his wife's influences, and that's why he should never marry any foreign wife who might lead him astray to worship foreign gods and for him to commit spiritual adultery. That would be to replace God in his life as first in his life. We are to have no other gods before him. We are to love him most of all so that everything else, I mean, remember what Jesus says, what our love for him is to be like in Scripture, that by comparison, we would hate those who were closest to us. Remember how he said, unless you hate your father and your mother, your wife, your children, and your possessions, even your own life, you can't be my disciple by which we know he doesn't mean literally to hate them. He wants us to love them. But by comparison, our love for him must be that much greater so that we always put him first and we don't let anyone or anything lead us astray from him. Now, secondly, he says in the second commandment, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, thousands of generations, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, you know, the Roman... The Roman church um, takes this commandment and combines it with the first and says that he's just simply telling us that we are not to make an idol of a foreign god and worship it, okay? Don't have other gods before me. Don't make an idol uh, of some other god and, and worship that. And so they combine these two things. But we, we don't believe that. We believe that this is the second commandment, and it's actually requiring something different. He's not simply repeating what he said in the first commandment. Now, making an idol and worshiping it can be seen, of course, as having another god. We certainly are not to do that. But what he's telling us here is that he does not want us to worship him through idols, through images. As a matter of fact, he points out on one occasion how he did not reveal himself to them in a particular form and because he didn't intend for them to make an image of that and to worship that. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And what he doesn't want to do is for us to worship him through images. Now, remember what the Israelites did when Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments how they made that golden calf. And, you know, we might be tempted to think that they had abandoned God and they were worshiping false gods, but they were actually seeking to worship Yahweh through that golden calf because they proclaimed a feast to the Lord, to Yahweh. And they said, this is your God. This is Elohim, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Okay, so... They were doing the very thing he's forbidding us to do here in the second commandment. And Rehob, excuse me, Jeroboam did exactly the same thing when he made two golden calves and placed them in two different places in, in the northern region, in, in the land of Israel, to keep, after the split had just taken place between north and south, to keep those who wanted to remain true to the true worship of God in Jerusalem from returning to Jeroboam 
And when he set up those calves, he said, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt. Again, he was saying, worship Yahweh through these golden calves. Now, God is telling us in this commandment that if we are to love him, he, that we need to worship him the way that he tells us to worship him. I mean, God knows what he wants. He knows what's pleasing to him. And he doesn't leave it up to us to guess or to figure it out or, or to become innovative. I mean, innovation today is, is kind of the rule in worship, isn't it? Uh, churches try to think of new ways to worship God that will be attractive to unbelievers so that their churches can become full. We call that seeker-sensitive worship. Well, the Lord doesn't want us to do that. We can have an evangelistic meeting to try to attract unbelievers there and, and give them the gospel as long as we're not doing a bait and switch, you know, where we kind of tempt them in and lead them to believe we're going to do one thing and then we end up doing something else. But we shouldn't make his worship service to be a, a seeker-sensitive in, you know, kind of thing. We, should, we need to be doing what the Lord has called us to do. And what He wants us to do, what's pleasing to Him, is that His Word is read, as we've just done, and preached or explained and, and applied so that we will know about His love for us and we will know how we are to love Him in return. He wants us to sing psalms and hymns so that we can focus on his, his glory and on His love, and so we can express our love to Him in return. He wants us to pray that we might grow in, in grace and become more like Him so that we might be the means of others coming to know Him, and He wants us to pray for them as well, that He might be glorified through them. And of course, He wants us to celebrate the Lord's table, which is a memorial of His Son's giving His life for us. Every Lord's Day, He doesn't want us to forget that great act of love. And He wants us to spend time with each other so that we can encourage and build each other up with our faith and our gifts. So that's really what the second commandment is all about. Now, thirdly, He says in the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Now, I think many, if not most Christians, believe that what the Lord is saying here is, is simply, don't use my name as a swear word. Now, he is saying that, but he's saying that more indirectly than directly. What he is saying directly here is that we are never to use his name in a vain, empty, meaningless way by making promises, by taking vows, by taking oaths that we do not keep. See, if we make a promise to the Lord and we don't keep it, then that's asking God to bear witness to something we say we're going to do, but then we don't do it. We have just lifted up His name to vanity. We have just taken His name in vain. That's exactly what He's referring to here. And what that means is this, that, that if we have entered into a, a vow, if we've bound ourselves in a covenant, taken vows, that we need to be true to those if we're married, right? We need to be faithful to those marriage vows. God bore witness to those vows. We need to keep them. If we are members of the church, we love Him by being faithful to those vows. If we say something is true, that thing needs to be true. Let your yes be yes. If, if it's not true, let your no be no. Okay? God is witness to everything that we say, even if we do not invoke His name. Jesus said that, you know, for those unbelievers, every idle word they speak will be brought up against them. Now, so we are to love Him by saying what we mean and meaning what we say, keeping our promises, the ones that we make to Him. And then finally, he tells us, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is the one that is largely forgotten today. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day 
and made it holy. Now, I don't have time to get into a full exposition of, the, of, the, of this commandment, but let me just say this, that it is a part of the Ten Commandments. It does give to us the time frame that we are all to set aside, that we might meet together and worship the Lord. It gives to all of us a day off to spend with Him. In the Old Covenant, it was the seventh day of the week, the day that, on which God rested from the work of creation. But in the New Covenant, it's on the first day of the week, the day that our Lord Jesus Christ entered into His rest after the work of the new creation when He rose from the dead. So we see the early church meeting on the first day of the week in order to worship God. They still met on the seventh day of the week, though, so that they could go into the synagogue and they could be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if we are to worship God and love Him and honor Him as He calls us to, as we promised that we would, we do need time to do this. And that's what the Sabbath day is all about. It is a day off, a day off from work. Notice the other six days are for work. On the seventh day, God says, I give you a day off, okay? You don't have to do your employment today. You don't have to do your housework today. You don't have to work on keeping your home clean. You don't have to do your landscaping. You don't have to work on your car and keep your, you know, do your car maintenance. You don't have to go shopping. You don't have to do any other work or any other duty. I give you this day to spend with, with me. And along those lines, he also says, I also give you a break from your worldly recreations that leads your thinking away from me so that you can spend the day, he says, with the one that you love the most. I mean, if you love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, are you going to have a hard time spending a day with him? Remember what heaven is all about. It's spending eternity with him, every day with him, all day, for the rest of eternity. If that doesn't seem appealing to you, then... Well, then we need to grow in grace, right? <laughs> we need to grow in our love for the Lord. We should desire these days. So he gives us this day so we can spend it with him, meeting together to worship him, to adore him, to see his glory through his worship, that we might grow more in love with him so that we might better be able to serve him during the six days that we are working. Now, notice in this commandment, he also wants us to give others the day off, too. That's something else that we tend to miss as Christians. We don't want other people to have to work for us. I mean, you're not going to, unless it's necessary work, you know. I mean, if it's freezing cold and your heater goes out, you need to have the heater guy come in and fix it. That's for your life, right? Doctors and nurses need to be working, uh, firemen and policemen and all of that. But there's a lot of unnecessary work going on right now, too, doesn't need to be taking place today, and we just need to make sure that we're not making other people work for us, like going to a restaurant or to a store and having people work, you know, serve us if we don't need to do that. If we're traveling, we need to go to a restaurant. If we need medicine because we're sick, we need to go to the store, but for the most part, we can do that on other days. If it doesn't have to be done on this day, we need to make sure others also have this rest, whether they worship God or not. You know, they may not want to, but they should, and they should have that time off to do it. Okay, so that, that is what the Lord wants us to do. And again, if we want to see what that looks like, we, we have a perfect example of this being lived out in our Lord Jesus Christ, who loved the Lord his God with all of his heart. This is what gave him zeal for his Father's glory. Remember how, again, Dr. Reeves was reminding us about Standing for the truth. Where do you find the courage to stand for the truth? Where do you find the kind of courage Luther had? Where do you find the courage Paul had? Where do you find the courage Jesus had? It was because of his love for his Father and his zeal for his glory. He could not sit back while his Father was dishonored. He would do anything, even to the giving of his life, to honor him. This is what compelled him to use all the powers of his mind, all the faculties of his soul, all of his strength to serve him, doing his Father's will, as we know, on one occasion he said was more satisfying to his soul than eating and drinking was to his body, even though he was tired and weary, sitting by the well, his disciples go into the city of the Samaritans to get food. They bring food back to him, 
And he says, I've already eaten. I have food that you don't know anything about that, you know, there's more satisfying. And that food was to do his father's will, which he had just done in ministering the gospel to the Samaritan woman. Jesus worshiped his father according to his word from the heart with all of his powers. He didn't merely go through the motions as the Pharisees did. He kept his vows, his promises to his father, particularly that one to guarantee the blessings of the covenant for us. He became our guarantee, our surety by making sure the conditions were met. And he not only faithfully spent the Sabbath in worship and fellowship and works of mercy, he made sure his disciples did as well. He made sure no one around him did any unnecessary work for him. So he is the perfect example of how God would have us love him. So we really need to meditate, constantly meditate on his life so that we may follow in his steps as the Spirit leads us and encourages us. This is what the leading of the Spirit is. He's saying, this is how Jesus walked. This is how I want you to walk. We need to give in to that, yield to that, let him direct us that way and empower us to live as Jesus lived. And it all comes from this love that he gives to us. We need to love God more if we are going to live more as Jesus lived. And we get that love, as we know, by, again, getting into the Word, getting into prayer, having fellowship with the Lord, and seeing His glory. Well, let's, um, let's take just a moment. Let's bow in silent prayer. Let's ask the Lord to um, help us to do these things, okay?